Good evening and welcome to this Center for Brooklyn History talk presented with our partners at the Social Science Research Council. My name is Marcia Eli. I am the Director of Programs at the Center for Brooklyn History, which was formerly the Brooklyn Historical Society. Now we are part of the Brooklyn Public Library and every week we offer free programs like this one that speak to the issues of our day through the library's programming arm BPL Presents. In the next few weeks, I'm excited to be hosting programs with WNYC's Rebecca Carroll, Roxanne Gay, Masha Gessen, Ayad Akhtar, and many others. I also want to mention that on Thursday of this week, BPL Presents has its annual Night of Ideas, a six hour marathon of programs that this year focuses on our America and includes a keynote by artist Ai Weiwei, many musical performances, and a series of conversations exploring how the rest of the world views the United States. So I hope you'll drop by. Tonight we focus on the United States and a conservative movement that is divided, if not outright warring. We have four remarkable guests who Jason will introduce in just a moment. But first, I want to invite all of you to share your questions for them throughout the program by simply typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Jason Rohde, who directs the Digital Culture Program, Social Data Initiative, and co-directs Media Democracy Program at the SSRC. Hi, Jason. Hi, Marcia, thanks for that introduction. And good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this collaborative event on behalf of the Social Science Research Council, or SSRC. SSRC, SSRC is an independent international nonprofit organization founded in 1923 and located in New York City. And for nearly 100 years, we have fostered innovative research, nurtured new generations of social scientists, and mobilized knowledge to inform important public issues. SSRC is home to a suite of programs in the area of media, technology, and politics. And this includes MediaWell, a project that maps urgent research on mis- and disinformation that you can find at mediawell.ssrc.org, the Social Data Initiative, which seeks to improve pathways for researchers to access the data necessary to understand the impact of social media on society, Just Tech, which understands technological change by foregrounding questions of inequity, social justice, and public impact, and our Media and Democracy program, which explores the ever-evolving relationship between media, technology, and democracy. Our work generally acknowledges that just as media and media infrastructure can be deployed as systems of democratization, transparency, and public empowerment, so too can they be used as systems of authoritarianism, surveillance, disinformation, and control. We invite you to learn about this suite of programs at ssrc.org. We're very grateful to the Knight Foundation for supporting this evening's event. We began planning tonight's program, Wither Conservatism, the State of the Right, several weeks ago. But the questions our panel will explore this evening were made ever more relevant by the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th, an event fueled by conspiracy, polarization, disinformation, domestic extremism, and white nationalism. And it's in this context that our panelists this evening will explore the legacy and future of the Conservative Party and politics in the United States. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. Leading our discussion is Jane Koston, who is host and editor of The Argument at the New York Times. As a senior politics reporter for Vox, she focused on conservatism, the American right, the GOP, and white nationalism. She's a former resident fellow at the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics and a roundtable regular on NPR news programs. Welcome, Jane. Hello, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to get this panel started. Great. Nicole Hemmer is an associate research scholar with the Obama Presidency Oral History Project at Columbia University and author of Messengers on, of the Right, Conservative Media and the Transformation of American Politics. She's working on a new book, Pitchfork Politics, about conservatism in the 1990s and is founder of Made by History at the Washington Post and co-host of the podcast Past, Present, and This Day in Esoteric Political History and also a columnist for CNN Opinion. So welcome, Nikki. Thanks so much for having me. Rick Perlstein is the author of four books on the history of American conservatism, including Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater, and the Unmaking of Amer the American Consensus, Nixonland, 
The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan, and Reaganland. His political journalism has appeared in publications including The New York Times, The Nation, and The New Republic. Well, welcome, Rick. Jason, it's, it's a pleasure and it's an honor. And Tasha Philpot is professor of government at the University of Texas at Austin, and her research focuses on the conditions that enable marginalized groups in American society to function in a more democratic system. She's authored three books, the most recent of which is Conservative But Not Republican, The Paradox of Party Identification and Ideology Among African Americans. Welcome, Tasha. Thank you. So we're grateful to all of you for joining us this evening. Jane, thank you for leading this discussion. I turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, so I think that the best way to start is at the beginning. And I'm interested to hear from all of you how we got to this point, both with the events that took place on January 6th and at our current moment in conservatism, because I would argue that this has been an ongoing theme of movement conservatism in the United States since the 1950s and 1960s, in which you have a conservative elite that believes it is saying something and the people who vote for conservatives who believe something entirely different. And what we saw on January 6th was those two entities crashing into one another. We had a number of members of Congress who had been reiterating for weeks, nearly months, that the election was stolen. And yet when people took to the Capitol and attempted to uh, seize the Capitol with violence, they seemed surprised that anyone had taken them to borrow a turn of phrase from a certain Washington Examiner writer uh, seriously and literally. But this is a very old story. We've seen this again and again. We saw this with the founding of National Review. We've seen this with the rise of the new right in the 1970s. So I'll start with you, Nikki. Where do you see this process beginning and how do you think it has sh been sh reshaped in our modern era, especially under Trump? Thanks so much for that, Jane. I think that's a really important introduction to seed it, not just in the current moment. I think a lot of people still cling to this idea of Trump exceptionalism. Um, and the things that we've seen blossoming in conservatism or on the right over the past several years have a much deeper history. Um, I think just based on what you were saying earlier about the, the gap between the elite and the uh, um, base, one of the things that we've actually been seeing in this moment is that there isn't that much of a gap between the elite and the base. Um, as you were saying, it was members of Congress who were not only fomenting a lot of this disinformation and rejection of the election, um, but also then, while blood was still drying on the floor of the Capitol, went to vote to overturn the election. That was the majority of the Republicans in the House. So this is not something where there's sort of this um, chasm between the people who represent the right on television and represent the right in elite circles and the base, but there has been a real merger of those two things over the past year. So that might actually be something that not entirely new, but it is newer. Where you see this though, I mean, you can go back to the 1940s and 1950s with um, what we call the old right um, and a resistance to democracy that was embedded in a lot of uh, what the old right was doing, a tendency toward conspiracy. Um, you can see that re-emerging in more familiar ways in the 1990s with the return of paleoconservatism, but also a new media ecosystem that was more prominent and circulated a lot of the you know, conspiratorial thinking, um, but elevated what um, I think elites would call a fringe, but what was really increasingly more and more of the conservative base. Um, and that has only continued to become more central to the Republican Party um, and to conservative politics. But I don't want to pretend that this also wasn't happening in the 1970s and, and 1980s. There really is a long history here. Rick, what do you think? I've been dating it back to 1787. Fair. Uh, of course, the bargain that the slave South struck to stay in the Union was that they would get operational control of American government, despite uh, whether they had a minority or not, right? This is the Senate, this is the Electoral College, this is the Three-Fifths Clause. And uh, of course, uh, one of the pieces of rhetoric that we've heard a lot in the past few weeks is, you know, this is really not America. I had a piece in the New Republic called This Is Us, 
And uh, the history that I sketched out there is that, you know, even subsequent to that, um, the uh, conspiracy, if you prefer, to uh, keep that situation in place uh, once the South's agricultural base started being exhausted was colonialism. Uh, spreading West, spreading slavery to the West, adding new states, adding new electoral votes, adding new senators. And uh, of course, when uh, politics failed, when uh, America chose to elect a president in 1860, who um, ran on a platform of stopping the spread of new slave states, uh, we saw violence. And the way I've been framing it is that, um, you know, the kind of reactionary minoritarianism uh, first of the slave South uh, was perfectly happy to advance their interests, you know, using kind of political slash parliamentarian means when those worked, uh, but violent means when that didn't. You know, I kind of have drawn the metaphor of something like Sinn Féin, the parliamentary wing, and the IRA, the paramilitary wing. And, you know, kind of going into the 20th century, uh, of course, you know, massive resistance was based on um, also a sort of minoritarian politics. In Nikki Hemmer's, Hemmer's, book, Hemmer's book, she writes about um, the kind of uh, electoral college schemes in 1956 and 1960 to um, make sure that there was a white supremacist candidate uh, for the Democratic Party and the, the Republican Party, or basically that there wouldn't be anyone who challenged white supremacy. That was what Strom Thurmond was up to in 1948. These were all minoritarian and when those failed, uh, that's when we saw, again, the paired military wing, if you prefer, the violence against um, full de democratic citizenship. And then, of course, the, the, the twist in the story was um, once the Democratic Party, uh, as the parties kind of sorted themselves out into ideological, ideologically consistent fa factions, uh, once we found, you know, kind of the, the Northern liberal slash African-American urban wing of the Democratic Party, uh, getting the upper hand, that's when you see them basically leave and choose a different political party. And the quotation I've been using is the Democratic, I mean, the Republican delegate, Goldwater delegate in 1964 at the convention, who said after the convention that we've moved the Mason-Dixon line up to Canada. And that's when you begin to see the nationalization of this very same dynamic of reactionary minoritarianism. Again, perfectly willing to use political means to uh, about to save white supremacy uh, when those worked, uh, but violent means when they don't. They didn't. The, the, the techniques that we saw during the Jim Crow era of voter suppression by claiming voter fraud and corruption, you know, as a through line for the Republican right up to the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, and then finally, once the coalition became smaller and smaller of kind of white superannuated reactionary citizens, uh, they managed to squeeze out one more victory using the minoritarian features of the constitution in 19, in 2016, seven out of eight, of course, uh, of the last presidential elections in which, you know, um, Republicans received fewer votes than Democrats managed to, managing to squeeze three presidential terms out of that nonetheless. Just like in the 19th century, once the political means failed, we saw the paramilitary wing of the reactionary and minoritarian coalition come to the fore again. And the basic theme all through these periods, through the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, and now the 21st century, is the belief of, uh, again, these reactionary minoritarians, white supremacists, we can talk about the terminology, uh, that they have basically um, the right to rule whether they're the majority of the country or not. And uh, the apotheosis of that was uh, January 6th, uh, the storming of the Capitol. Tasha, I'm interested because something that Rick just brought up that I, I noticed is we have a conceit of the Republican party and conservatism being essentially the same thing. That has not always been true. And as you've written about new, numerous times, conservatism and being a member of the Republican party are not, one does not often have much to do with the other. And we even heard a uh, former president, Donald Trump, repeatedly say that this isn't the conservative party, this is the Republican party. What do you think that, that idea of 
the relationship between conservatism and the Republican Party. How do you think that relationship has shifted over the last several decades that leads us to this moment where the Republican Party is taking on what some would argue would be very anti-conservative views, but then putting them, I think, in the mask of conservatism? Yeah, it, it, we can think of party identification, which is, you know, whether you identify as, as a Democrat, Republican, or something in between, or something external to that, versus ideology, which is essentially your outlook on the world. Um, those two have, have pretty much always been correlated, but what we find is in these last few decades, the country is becoming more por uh, polarized, and that um, conservatism is more and more being uh, associated with being a Republican. Um, just to go back to something Rick said, I would even push the beginning of this even further out to 1776, when part of the, the contention about who is American started with this idea of who's gonna be granted citizenship versus not. And one of the reasons that um, people were able to rally, you know, uh, potential American citizens to fight the Revolutionary War was the threat of England um, uh, creating an uprising among uh, Native Americans and Blacks. And so you have from the beginning this, this notion of conservatism tied very much to citizenship. So by the time we get to present day, we're thinking about conservatism, both in terms of, you know, I like more spending for public schools, I like more spending on, on defense, but really at the heart of it is less so much about policy differences and more about identity politics and the defining of who gets part of this nation. I think particularly in terms of the insurrection that happened earlier this month, that it was all about this reclamation of America, right? You know, the make, make American great again, which, uh, you know, didn't originate with Trump, but certainly was part of his, his rallying cry. And that um, there was this idea that these people who were storming the Capitol we're doing exactly the same thing that the founders did in the Revolutionary War, which is to say that they're being uh, they, they're being oppressed, and it's their constitutional well, not constitutional, but it's their duty to uh, therefore dismantle government and create a new one that more favors them. Nikki, I'm interested to think about the role that conservative media has played because again, we see. Um, a two-tiered conservative media environment. On the one tier, you have, I keep using the term elite, but you, you understand what I mean. You have the, ideo <laughs> the ideological elite of conservatism, the Heritage Foundation, National Review, the American Conservative, a host of publications who have an understanding and they believe an agreed upon understanding of what conservatism is. And then you have the extra, the Fox News environment. I would even say um, Breitbart, the it, an external media environment that is more about a conservative id, conservatism as reflexive anti-liberalism, not the embrace of anything, but the rejection of something else. How does that two-tiered media environment play into what's taken place now? So I do think that those are part in some ways of the same project. There are certainly um, media outlets on that elite tier that are kind of retconning an intellectual justification for a set of policies or a worldview and giving it a kind of um, sheen of an intellectual coherence and a um, philosophical Ethical coherence that it might not actually have. Now there are some, I think we have seen some, some places of breaking during the Trump administration. You've seen places um, actually be founded like the Dispatch and the Bulwark um, who see themselves in opposition to whatever is happening within the conservative movement right now and see themselves as the remnant of that conservative elite media um, that National Review used to present itself as. Um, but even within that uh, more anti-liberal media that you point to like Fox News, conservatives see that in a framework of elite media and non-elite media that Fox News represents a kind of establishment right. voice now within conservatism versus the Newsmaxes, the OANs. Um, and so the, the growth 
and the kind of fracturing of the conservative media environment has allowed that conservative base to pick and choose which voices they see as legitimate. It was one thing when you just had a handful of radio programs in the 50s and 60s and publications that you saw as representing sort of movement conservative, but now there isn't that same kind of constraint. And so if you feel like Fox News, for instance, isn't conspiratorial enough for you, you've got a whole lot of other options. And if there are enough of you, you can actually hurt Fox News's bottom line, or at least their ratings by rejecting them. And so conservative media has become this great, huge playing field that's not dictating to the base and is not necessarily dictating to politicians, but is caught up in the same struggles that the uh, conservative movement that the right more broadly is caught up in these days about where it position, positions itself in relationship to conspiracy theories, in relationship to misinformation, in relationship to violence. Like you now have a smorgasbord and you get to pick in these conservative media places. And if you get too far to the mainstream of the base, then you get rejected as just another liberal voice as Fox News has been. Right. So it, it's an interesting, um, you know, it kind of the tail wagging the dog situation. I know there are a couple of questions that we have about um, regulating media, which as a libertarian-ish person, I have my own feelings on that we can get to later. But that seems to be a, a real topic of discussion, this idea of regulating Fox News, where some of the issue here is that it's not Fox News. Fox News is attempting to appeal uh, there's been a lot of observers who have noticed over the last couple of weeks that Fox News has perhaps moved further to the right in an attempt to get back that audience that it is losing to OAN, to Newsmax, to the gateways pundit of the world of the world to outlets that are even more willing to tell an audience specifically what they want to hear. In some ways, the these networks are, you know, they're the dog that caught the car and they don't know what really what to do with it. Yeah, and I don't think I agree with you um, as a civil libertarian. I don't think that regulation is the way out of this. I mean, the, the fairness doctrine is the thing that has been coming up a lot more lately. And I have a piece coming out in CNN tomorrow about this, which is just like, that was a doctrine that was created in a, a time of media scarcity. Media scarcity right. is not the problem now. And I don't think we can regulate our way out of what is a social and political problem. I think there are things media companies can do um, so that they are not... Um, centers of uh, amplification of misinformation. Um, but if your goal is to be that center of amplification of misinformation, it, it actually can be pretty difficult to just regulate yourself out of that because there's a, a willing audience um, hungry to consume that kind of content. Rick, I'm interested in some of the basic conceits of what movement conservatism looks like right now and to talk about that. And I keep saying movement conservatism because I think of very, there's a difference between philosophical conservatism, which if you, you know, if you are into Edmund Burke, as some people might be, the effort to get philosophical conservatism into public spheres and eventually into law is what I see as the attempted project of what movement conservatism perhaps was supposed to be. But I'm interested of the conceits of the anti-elitism, the mm -hmm. anti-urbanism, the mm -hmm. anti, this idea of who, cons who, who the ideal conservative is supposed to be, which is so interesting because as people have repeatedly said, Donald Trump fit absolutely none of those qualifiers. Right. And yet we see repeatedly this idea of the ideal conservative being this rural Christian entity who abided by a specific set of moral norms as being the center of conservative life, even while, you know, I've been to the Fox News building, it is very much located in New York City, a place that it, that's where it is. This can, yes, I know. The conceit of what conservatism has been basing its ideology around and yet largely dispensing with that ideology when right. it's time to nominate a former Democrat from New York, who is now a resident of Florida, or when it's you know, these specific ideas. I'm interested to talk to you about that history. Where does that come from? Where does the idea of this, I, this conservative ideal, where does that stem from? Yeah, it's interesting. I never dreamed that I'd be talking so much about the 18th century. I mean, maybe it's the University of Chicago, like undergrad in me, but it's really interesting to go back and read Edmund Burke. 
uh, his reflections on the revolution in France and see how much of what he writes kind of has a little bit of Fox News in it. There's a lot of trolling in there. And um, Burke is an interesting figure that you can actually pull all the way through to the 21st century in Trump. And then here was this guy who was basically arguing, uh, he, was, he, was, he was basically an outsider, he was Irish. And he was basically arguing as the kind of intellectual forefather of modern conservatism that the elites, the bourgeoisie, you know, the aristocrats whose job it was to kind of uh, vouchsafe the stability of society were screwing it up. And that turned out to be an enormously influential kind of sociological pattern. And that the people who become conservative leaders are the people who, um, are aspiring to basically become members of the upper echelon who kind of are knocking at the door and not quite getting there. And one important thing in analyzing this is all through the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century, is there's no specific policy content to conservatism. You know, I've seen like Ku Klux Klan pamphlets in the 1920s arguing we should have a, we should have national health care because the immigrants are so dirty and we'll all get germs, right? The Ku Klux Klan called for a national education curriculum. They wanted a Department of Education because they didn't want the Catholic schools, you know, to teach you know kids to be loyal to the Pope, right? So you know, when people talk about, oh well, they were for small government, now they're for big government, etc. But the people who become conservatives, and by that, basically, the people who form a positive ideology about how to preserve hierarchy and authority, and basically ins and outs, and the right people ruling, have this constant sociological. Um, kind of um, profile. The best, the best uh, metaphor I found for it is uh, uh, there was a mid-century American political philosopher named Peter Virick. And when he wrote about McCarthyites, he called it the revenge of the noses. And by noses, he meant the noses pressed up against the window at the ball, you know, who can't kind of get inside, you know, the elite cotillion, you know, who really want to get in. And that's Nixon, right? That's, that's the silent majority. You know, that's Sarah Palin, you know, saying, you know, that, um, you know, she's just a, you know, tough mama, you know, from Alaska. Uh, that's Donald Trump, the guy from the outer boroughs, you know, whose who's fantasy is, you know, making his way into the Manhattan elite, right? So it's Joe the plumber, right? There's, there's this, this, you know, endless, endless examples. There's, you know, the, the Klan leader in the 1920s who said, that you know the people who were following the clans were clan were um, people driving secondhand Fords, right? This idea that um, uh, there's this liberal cultural elite, cosmopolitan, based in kind of the metropole, who'd look down their noses at these kind of people who work hard and play by the rules and hew to traditional values, is a constant in the history of conservatism. You know, now we have Josh Hawley, you know, taking to the New York Post saying, you know, the elites at Simon & Schuster are keeping him from publishing his book. And, um, you know, I think the bottom line is um, managing a complex modern urban technological society, you know, requires a certain kind of technocratic elite. And elites um, breed resentment, right? And, you know, one of the ways that we haven't talked about the Democrats and liberalism, one of the ways that Democrats and liberals since the New Deal have, you know, um, achieved their power base is by pointing to the elites that oppress you on the job and in the economy. Uh, and the cunning of the conservative image electoral tradition is the idea that the true elites are the people who oppress you kind of culturally, you know, it comes to, you know, kind of recognition, right? And, that and I think I just want to jump in and bring in business elites too as the oppressed. I just want to jump in there because I think that's a really important point that we um, the elites are for many conservatives, the media, not the people who actually determine policy. So you can have an environment in which Republicans control many, many gubernatorial mansions, many state houses control the, you know, the House and the Senate and control the White House, and yet they are not in power because they do not control the media writ large. And I think a lot of people who are further on the left make the argument of like, we, we aren't in charge of them either. Um, but I'm interested, uh, Tasha, perhaps you could talk a little bit about the, the way that that conceit of who the ideal conservative is and how focusing on, um, as Tucker Carlson calls them, 
normal Americans, how that conceit leaves out non-white conservatives and where the role of non-white conservatives have played. Because we've got a couple of questions asking about Republicans perhaps overperforming with non-white voters in 2020. And yet we saw immediately after the election, a kind of, well, hang on on that, because then all these people voted in Milwaukee and Detroit, wink, wink, and we can't trust those areas. And a, you know, at a certain point, it's just a foghorn, not really a dog whistle. So I'm interested to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of making headway into the, in, uh, the Republican Party making headway into minority communities, I mean, we live in a system where there is definitely a power hierarchy. And um, kind of how Rick mentioned the, the noses, the range of the noses, that you have groups looking in from the outside that desperately want to be on the inside. One of the things about American democracy is that it was envisioned as not having a permanent aristocracy like, like England and, and other industrialized nations. And yet we do have this, this fixed aristocracy in the sense that the biggest predictor of being rich is being born rich, right? So you have people who work full time in, in this country and can barely pay their rent. All that to say is there's definitely an incentive um, if you're on the outside to look to say the Republican party who is magnificent at, at fundraising, who typically represents the, the upper echelon of the socioeconomic strata, and to say, you know what, I wanna be part of that. Some of my interests don't correspond with that, and some of the rhetoric definitely doesn't favor my group. But if I can do, you know, if I can prove myself to be similar to uh, the mainstream society, then I can be integrated into that. So Nicole, I want to go back to you because I'm fascinated by this idea. You, you made the point of having a ideological retconning moment. We saw that happen with Trumpism. I've repeatedly argued to leap in here that there is no such thing as Trumpism, that there was no real ideological project surrounding it. It's just a lot of people decided like, this seems great and filled in a vacuum. And so there've been a host of conservative writers um, who have raised the idea of, you know, someone like Patrick Deneen, this idea of post-liberalism, this idea of a national conservatism that exists outside of Trump and after Trump. What, what do you think the future of that project looks like, especially without the person who rendered it a project? Does this project exist if Hillary Clinton wins the presidency in 2016? I think that it does still exist um, because of Donald Trump's popularity among conservatives and Republicans, um, but also that he's again building on trends that were already there within the Republican Party. I mean, I do think in um, journals like American Greatness, there has been this attempt to forge a kind of um, both intellectual tradition and an intellectual structure for Trumpism. I think in order to appeal to people who like having that kind of philosophical basis. I don't think that a lot of voters really need that. But I think that right. I, I don't think in necessarily that there were a lot of people making the argument that like what they really wanted was this deep discussion of, you know, <laughs> pago law or something like that. We, we've seen that a little bit. Yeah, but I think that there is a way that, that buys you purchase into certain conversations if you have that kind of intellectual framework or intellectual structure. And some people like having that kind of intellectual coherence to it. And there are, again, strains in conservatism that Trumpism, to the extent that it exists, um, reflects, right? There's a, there's a paleoconservatism that runs through some of um, Trumpism, a paleolibertarianism that the alt-right reflects um, that comes through um, Trumpism as well. So, you know, it's an interesting project. I think that it has to happen in some ways because it's competing with another um, type of conservatism that sees itself as a coherent philosophical and intellectual tradition. And so if you want to go toe to toe with National Review or Weekly Standard, RIP, you want to have some sort of intellectual framework with which to have that discussion and to gain legitimacy and purchase in circles that Trump himself might not and his politics might not necessarily have purchased into. I don't know that it's the best reflection of the appeal of Trump, of Donald Trump. I think that's more of a question of um, emotions and to a certain extent material um, goods rather than an intellectual project. But it is part of the work of trying to continue whatever this movement is um, beyond Donald Trump. 
Rick, uh, Nicole brought up paleo conservatism. And I think often, um, occasionally when I make this point about Trumpism, I think a lot of people reference Pat Buchanan's run in 1992 or um, Pat Buchanan's uh, RNC speech in 1992 more specifically. And I'm interested to see what you think of paleo conservatism as that through line, because I think that there's, there's a sense that one of the challenges we have, and there's a really smart piece that I reference all the time that was uh, by Matthew Walther in The Week, that Pat Buchanan and his Republican National Convention speech in 1992, where he yells about gay people, um, he has an actual policy platform and an actual ideologi ideological promise of things that would be done. And Walther makes the point in his piece that now the entire conceit of what Trump did was like, well, we'll just have someone who his very presence triggers the libs and makes people mad. And he doesn't even have to do anything. He just has to tweet about it until a free market decision was made and he can't tweet about it anymore. But I'm interested to see what you think about the relationship between paleoconservatism, between that kind of Buchanan wing and what the Republican Party looks like now, where people are willing to say the same sorts of things as Pat Buchanan, but at no point are is anyone thinking about proposing legislation to do anything about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess paleoconservatism is a word that signifies the strain of conservative thought. And tell me if you think I'm right, Nick, Nikki and Jane and Natasha, that kind of um, comes out of uh, you know kind of the the, the 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 movement in the 1930s when kind of America begins kind of inching towards arming itself to take on Nazi Germany, right? And this is a bunch of people who uh, have much more isolationist political liberties. And at that time, it kind of signifies a distrust of England, a distrust of Wall Street, certainly kind of in the case of uh, someone like, uh, you know, um, Charles Lindbergh, you know, a distrust of, you know, the Jews as one of these cosmopolitans and basically this idea of cosmopolitanism, right? It's kind of like this kind of localist idea and, you know, it finds its kind of expression through kind of people who question FDR that he kind of let Pearl Harbor happen on purpose. And sure, they're perfectly willing to, you know, kind of fold them, throw themselves into the Cold War because, you know, they hate communism, but they're most, you know, kind of profound idea about communism and it's it's much more internal subversion and they would really don't want to see America becoming a global power. So let's kind of frame conservatism as that. And, you know, um, it's, it's really into kind of um, industrial might, you know, the idea of this kind of brawny white working class as a gender component. And I think there's always been um, a bit of, you know, kind of nostalgia for that and a, a space for that. And I saw that in particular on the ground, I think it was at the 2012 uh, Republican convention when Condoleezza Rice and someone else, I don't remember, kind of both gave speeches saying America needs to stay engaged in the world. We can't use the kind of the failure in Iraq to kind of, you know, withdraw within our borders. And, you know, after like, you know, days and days of lusty cheering for every speech, there was, you know, dead silence. You know, you could kind of hear a pin drop, right? And Donald Trump's position in that is, you know, you can look at the, um, the full page ad he took, in, took out in 1987, you know, when she said, you know, the rest of the world is laughing at us. We have to kind of withdraw from these, you know, international agreements and organizations like NATO that, you know, basically are fleecing us, right? So the basic idea is this kind of, I, you know, withdrawal from the idea of America as the world's policeman. There's been these strange coalitions between left and right on that kind of thing. But there's always been this kind of space, you know, kind of uh, within this kind of isolationist Midwestern tradition that had, you know, deeply distrusts the idea that, um, you know, uh, of the world, right? Of, of cosmopolitanism, of the idea of, uh, you know, now it's kind of like the opposite of paleoconservatism in the, in, the, in, in the words of its propagandists is neoconservatism. And there's also kind of a slight kind of Jewy thing about that. These people who are like, you know, they're not in these small towns in mid the Midwest who are sending their boys, you know. Um, and, uh, I think that uh, the seduction of that uh, is, is, is part of what made Trump's rhetoric, you know, so powerful. Um, it's a very kind of complicated business, right? Because so much of what Trump does, and this is where you get into the idea of what are the actual policies is, you know, bullshit, right? I mean, he sent, sent lots of people, you know, kind of to die and, uh, you know, is perfectly obsessed with the idea of military might and what's, what is, you know, kind of take their oil 
you know, other than kind of a globalist project. But the idea that, you know, the strain of conservatism that abhors, you know, globalism, you know, at Claire Booth Luce, you know, called Globaloni, uh, is a big part of the right-wing tradition. And uh, I don't think, you know, that's gonna go away either. And I think there was a lot of, you know, kind of space for that precisely because America's forever wars, you know, the 300 military bases we have all over the world uh, are, um, you know, repressed. You know, the, 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 the danger of that is repressed. And I, I'll just make one final point about that. You know, the fact that one fifth of the American, uh, of, the, of the people who are arrested, you know, at the Capitol are veterans, you know, tells us that there is a kind of um, sociological, moral, political cost to our forever wars. There was a lot of trauma, you know, amid those group of people. And that's not to excuse them and not to say that they should not be, you know, punished to the full extent of the law. But just as my neighbor here in Chicago, Kathleen Ballou, points out about the Vietnam War. I was know, just about to war, bring her up. War, war, she's right around the corner. War produces broken souls. And there'll always be an audience for that sort of kind of isolationist idea because it also kind of merges so nicely into the idea that if, um, you know, we just kind of, um, keep our tribe together and don't engage with other tribes will be, you know, safer, will be existentially more secure. Uh, Kathleen Ballou wrote the terrific book, Bring the War Home, which is about the rise of the white power movement, which stems from people return, some people returning from Vietnam and their experiences and the idea of guerrilla warfare as a means by which to fight the federal government. But Tasha, I'm interested to get in the subject of religion and talking about faith, because when I've had conversations with, um, conservatives who identify as being Christian and their relationship with the Republican party is not necessarily they, they believe that the Republican party shares their values, but more so that it will protect them as a bulwark against the people who don't. And I, now that we're starting to see, um, and there's always been, I think that occasionally people forget that um, uh, Christian leftism is not a recent concept, RIP Oscar Romero, um, but the conceit of Christianity and the role of faith as being something purely of the right, I think people are beginning to understand that that's not true now and has not has never been true. But what do you think of the role of faith has played, especially in um, the, how people identify as conservatives and how people identify as Republicans? Mm -hmm. So I think... Um... Faith plays an interesting role in the sense that it's very much tied to public policy. And one of the issues that have come up, particularly with the confirmation of different justices under the, the Trump administration is this idea of, uh, uh, is the issue of abortion and whether or not that right is gonna be protected with, you know, it should it be challenged in the Supreme Court um, anytime soon. Um, people support the Republican party for a number of different reasons. Um, they're conservative maybe because across the board, they're conservative. They may be conservative because of religiosity. Um, they may be conservative because they're just anti big government, regardless, regardless of the program. And so you find people who are single issue, um, single issue Republicans based on their religiosity and, and uh, issues tied to that. And the idea that, you know, conservative conservatism is essentially protecting the status quo. It's not ruffling the feather, so to speak. And as you said, the need to want to have a party that's gonna protect the status quo. I mean, we know that the majority, um, the, the power majority is Christian, is Christianity in the United States and always has been. And so there's definitely a push to make sure that that's not, you know, that's not trampled upon. That's not, that, that power is not shifted uh, more equitably across different religions. But what's interesting I would say is that um, one of the most consistent findings is that uh, African-Americans are the most religious group in American politics and their religiosity predicts party identification in the opposite direction of whites, which is to say the more religious they are, the more likely they are to support the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're actual Christians. I think that <laughs> I think it's an interesting point, especially because I think that the experience um, we've seen that I that identifying as Christian but not going to church uh, measured uh, someone's support for voting for Donald Trump. That we saw the rise of a to quote a adult film actress who wrote for the Federalist the uh, sex and rock and roll conservative, where it has absolutely nothing to do with a 
sense of traditional moral virtue as practiced in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but this idea of uh, self-enjoyment and triggering the libs. But I want to talk, I want to get to, since we're winding down a little bit, the future of the Republican Party. And I think that there are a couple of different directions we can go with this. I think we have seen the number of state parties, um, the Arizona Republican Party, the Hawaii Republican Party, and before them, the Virginia Republican Party that appear to be, and I am putting this delicately, enjoying the fruits of being in a permanent minority position where those parties have become so subsumed by Trumpism or by this conceit of Trump that they are willing to lose elections in order to continue down the purity spiral. And we are seeing a host of new, new representatives in Congress who are very much along that track. And we've seen, obviously, the results of the most recent election. But there are a lot of um, people battling within conservatism. There is an ongoing fight of, you know, is this the conservatism of Mitt Romney or is this a conservatism of... Ted Cruz, what it, where does the Republican Party go from here? And I'm interested to ge get each of your thoughts because I think that the Republican Party as opposition, I think, is an ideal because the Republican Party has always liked to, to quote uh, William F. Buckley, to stand athwart progress yelling stop, while having the actual reins of power has proven to be more challenging for the party. But the permanent opposition status that we're seeing from state parties would not bode well for the overall party. So I'm interested to get thoughts from each of you of where do you think this goes? What, what does the Republican Party look like in 2022, 2024? Nicole, let's start with you. I mean, if you take a snapshot of the Republican Party right now, it's clear that to the extent that there is a Mitt Romney wing, it is very, very small. I mean, even increasingly at the, the state level, you saw that Rob Portman isn't going to be running for re-election in the Senate. And the overwhelming majority of the representation in the, the Congress is more in that Trump wing. You saw that with the vote to overturn the election. You saw that today with the vote in the Senate um, to declare the um, impeachment trial unconstitutional or however Rand Paul put it in that, um, in that bill. So, you know, I'm not super optimistic and I'm not optimistic not only because of that um, representational imbalance, but also the incentive structures of the party, of the media ecosystem, of the economic system in which conservatism and right wing politics exists are all pushing in the direction of moving even further, I don't know how we want to do this directionally, further to the right or further into Trumpism or further into um, whatever direction the party has been heading for a while now. And you even see this with something like Fox News, right? Again, it had a choice after the election. Um, does it want to move in a newsier direction or does it want to compete with Newsmax? And in switching up at seven o'clock hour and beginning to switch up its lineup, it's clear that it wants to compete with Newsmax because it believes that it wants to go hunting where the ducks are and the ducks are all watching Newsmax right now. And so, you know, at the moment at least, and this could certainly change, I mean, certainly the Republican Party that wrote the autopsy in 2013 looks very different from the Republican Party today. Um, but just judging on what the incentive structures are right now, you would expect the Republican Party to look a lot more like um, some of its fringier members than to look like Mitt Romney in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Rick, what do you think? Well, Nikki and I are historians and historians, you know, are kind of wary of predictions. I never- Well, predicting things never goes well. And I am asked, I am sending you all on a fool's errand and I'm very yes. sorry. And uh, so, so you know, I'm the thing I pointed that really, I just want to point out that, you know, like any things, something, things will happen that we couldn't possibly conceive now. I mean, if someone had told you in 1974, 1975, that the guy who would redeem the Republican party and bring it to the White House was the guy, who, the one guy in the Republican party who refused to denounce Richard Nixon and said Watergate wasn't a big deal, you know, you would have definitely been thought to have had a extra hole in your head, right? But uh, I think the point I want to make about that is that, you know, Mitt Romney conservatism in itself is, you know, pretty damn nasty, right? I mean, um, Google chronicling Mitt's mendacity, it was a, a blog that was kept up during the 2012 uh, um, uh, campaign during by Steve Bannon, and it was like 30, 40, 50 
episodes, in each one having 10, 20 straight up lies, you know, that Mitt Romney told during the 2012 election. You know, Jeff Flake, you know, he's the great kind of never Trump who kind of fell on his sword, and didn't run again. You know, if you read his, his, his book, Conscience of a Conservative, you know, he talks about, he's pines for the days when, you know, you could just basically, uh, Mexican men would just come across the border and you could just kind of exploit them as cheap labor and they never brought their families, right? It seems, uh, going back to 2012 and 2008, you see that there's always been this kind of, even with Mitt Romney, he's going to CPAC and describing himself as being no severely conservative. Right, he, he, right. he played with that too. Right, so, and I mean, so this has always been there. There's been a tradition within American liberalism of always kind of domesticating the last generation of conservatives. Let's talk about Liz Cheney, right? I mean, so see, she's kind of the face of this kind of attempt to try and kind of uh, redeem a Republican conservatism that's non-Trump, that's post-Trump. I mean, what's a bigger conspiracy theory when it comes to kind of its effect on the world? Is it QAnon or is it the idea that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction? Right? There's a million, a million corpses behind that one and the destruction of American foreign policy. So we already see a ratcheting of the center of American political gravity to the right, you know, even if the Cheney wing wins. Right? So, but like, like, like Nikki says, there really is no um, structure within our incentive system, our first past the post, two party, you know, kind of primary, primaries have kind of dispositive this, this election within, within a kind of ideological parliamentary style party that, you know, enforces, you know, ideological conformity. So, you know, I mean, again, bringing in the Democrats, uh, you know, I mean, really the only hope we have is, you know, um, President Biden uh, and his Democratic majority, you know, governing compassionately at well, you know, and, you know, hiving off enough voters on the margin to, you know, basically turn the Republicans into, you know, a loyal opposition, hopefully without too many people willing to spill blood in its interests. You know, I mean, um, Joe Biden, you know, s spending all his political capital in his first hundred days on, you know, vaccinating people. I mean, the way I've been putting it is, you know, grandparents being able to hug their grandchildren may have a powerful concentrating effect in teaching people that uh, activist government uh, can, um, make the world a better place and make uh, what the Republicans are selling seem a less, lot less attractive on the most intimate level. Tasha, what do you think? So I got out of the prediction game uh, back in 2016, but yeah. you asked me, um, you know- Again, have, I sent you on a fool's errand and I'm very sorry. I mean, we have to remember conservatism is an ideology. Political parties have a specific function. Their, their mission isn't altruistic. Their goal is to achieve power through electoral politics. And I think the Republican Party has hit a, a sweet spot that they're going to continue to exploit. So in terms of like the Mitney Republicans versus say the Ted Cruz Republicans, they're going to keep going where the votes, were, votes are. And I, I think one of the, I wouldn't say good things about the insurrection, but one of the um, illuminating things that came out of that was dispelling the notion that these Trump folks were, you know, those backwoods hicks, you know, somewhere down south that um, that were marginalized from from the mainstream. When in fact, this these were people who were flying in on private jets. So, and and the sheer number of them proves that that the Republican Car Republican Party need not deviate from what it's doing right now. That they can come back, you know, in in 2024 with the same type of rhetoric and the same type of strategy. Um, and win an election, especially if they're if they succeed in voter suppression. So I think that we've got time for just I'm just going to ask you guys one more question very quickly. And I think that something I'm interested in is what do you see as being for the next two years, how do you think that Democrats should be thinking about the Republican Party? Because clearly Joe Biden believes in the conceit of having a loyal opposition. Many of the people who voted for Joe Biden would very much don't believe in the conceit of a loyal opposition. What do you think should be the Democratic position towards the Republican Party? Should there be, as some people have used the station of the Republican Party. Is there a mean someone brought up in the questions talking about John McCain? You know, we keep talking about these Republicans who now are getting that quote strange new respect, but this undercurrent has always existed. And I think that 
what should how should Democrats be thinking about Republicans right now? Uh, Rick, I'll I really start like with you. that metaphor of debathification. I haven't heard that one. Um, I think that um, it's very interesting uh, to see the willingness to kind of, of, of the White House already to kind of do what liberals have been kind of screaming at the top of the, their lungs that liberals should, a uh, president should, a democratic president should do for years, right? In their appointments and their willingness to use executive orders. Um, and I think that yes, um, you know, um, Biden believes in the civic religion of, of bipartisanship, which, um, really wasn't a big deal before the 60s, right? You've never heard people talking about bipartisanship. But you know, one of the things people pointed out with Obama is, well, maybe he doesn't really mean it. And uh, it's just kind of a, a nice kind of rhetoric. And he's going to realize that he has no negotiating partners on the other side who are in goodwill. I think Biden seems to be kind of uh, taking on board that perspective. And I think my thesis about why that happened is he really is an institutionalist who believes in um, experts running the government and the bureaucrats and um, seeing uh, the level of um, sabotage that went on uh, in the institutions of government against his attempts to basically fulfill the basic administrative function of having a transition of power, I think was very harrowing for him. And uh, I think that uh, his willingness to um, push past um, Republican um, uh, uh, intransigence in a way that of all people, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer have already been modeling in the past few years, that's, that, that could conceivably uh, uh, be a game changer. I think the real wild card in this is the kind of mainstream media that will continue to basically say, we have two parties, they're equally legitimate. Um, we have to give each party an equal voice on our shows, even if the Republicans you know, systematically lie which is not in fact unbiased. If you, if one party, um, you know, if, if, if you pass on a lie, whether, you know, it's true or not, uh, that systematically advantages the party that's willing to lie and makes you biased towards the Republicans. So I think the real wild card is whether this sort of salutary willingness of uh, the media to use words like lie and insurrection uh, holds or whether they're kind of revert, going to revert to form. Nicole, what do you think? I, I'm interested also because I think that what is largely ignored from these conversations, ironically, because we are technically talking about policymakers, is policy. No longer, there are a host of Republican and a few Democratic members of Congress who do very little policy making, but are very much about being seen being members of Congress. And I'm interested to see what you think about how Democrats should think about those people. Is there a means by which um, I have preferred to just go with the pretending some of these people don't exist, which is how I have largely existed for a long time. It's been great. But I'm interested to see what you think about how Democrats should be thinking about Republicans, especially Republicans who really seem to exist to, quote, trigger the libs. I mean, I think that you do probably what Joe Biden has in mind, which is you continue to hold out your hand and say, you are welcome to come along with us as we give the American people the things that they want. If you obstruct us too much so that we cannot give the American people the things that they want, then we'll find ways around you. And we will point to you and say, you are the reason that the American people aren't getting their $2,000 checks or they're not getting their vaccine or whatever it is. Um, and then otherwise, I think you you ignore them. You may, you know, you you reach out when you can, um, but the purpose of the Democrats being in power right now is to fulfill a policy agenda. And that should be their goal more than bipartisanship. Um, now, obviously there are structures that make that very difficult for them, um, but I don't think that something that the Obama administration did in its early years, which was to sit around and wait for Republicans to sign on to legislation before going forward with it when they didn't actually need those Republicans in the first place. That was a big mistake. And I think that Joe Biden watched that happen and um, is willing to move in a different direction. Tasha, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the last word. What do you think about how Democrats should be thinking about Republicans right now? I've long admired the Republican Party in its cohesiveness and its willingness to coalesce you know, a, around one point and stay there, regardless of whether or not they were right or wrong. And I think the Democrats certainly could learn something from that. I, I, to borrow 
a, a popular culture reference, I, I'm kind of subscribing to the Cobra Kai, no mercy, which yes. is to say they have a policy agenda and they should, they should move full throttle with it and not worry about, you know, meeting people in the middle and reconciling because that wasn't done the four years previously, right? So if we want to get, get the country back on track and these are the poly, policy prescriptions that you have, then the Democratic Party, as Nikki said, needs to just go ahead and do it. They have the majority in the House and the Senate. Um, push it through until they can't push anymore. And that would be, as, that would be my recommendation for the Democratic Party. Well, thank you, Nicole, Rick, Tasha. This has been tremendous. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jane. I'm going to go uh, Google Cobra Kai. Season three, it's on Netflix. It's fantastic. <laughs> Raises a lot of questions about the use of karate in schools. But besides that, no flaws. <laughs> thank you. All right. Business has been taken care of.